Morning. Uh, that's quite a long passage, isn't it? You might want to have your Bibles open so that as we go through it, you're sort of keeping track of what's going on. So we do need to read the whole passage to get the, the whole picture of this story, the healing of a man born blind. And this isn't the only time that Jesus has healed blind people. If you look in the other Gospels, there are other accounts, and sometimes it seems that there's like a job lot of people being blind, being healed. In Luke 8, we read of a blind man being healed, but Luke gives it just a very few verses. And in Matthew 15, it says, A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. So why does John go into such details for this particular healing? What does God want to say to us through this passage? So let's have a look and see what's going on. Firstly, there are a lot of characters in this story. We've got the disciples, we've got Jesus, the blind man, the invisible man, and we'll come to him a bit later, the neighbours, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and the man's parents. So we're going to have a look at each of those in turn. Jesus was walking along with a group of his disciples, those who were following him, watching him, learning from him. And as they see the blind man, they ask Jesus a question. Why was this man born blind? Following Jesus, being a disciple, was a new experience for them. As disciples, they were trying to learn about how this new kingdom of God thing worked. If Jesus was going to heal someone, did their past matter? Did they need to be perfect? Did they even need to be a follower themselves? And I can see myself in them. I don't know about you, but I'm curious about spiritual things, especially about Jesus. How does this thing work? Can I even begin to understand it? How, what, why? And I believe God honours our searching by beginning to reveal more and more to us by his spirit about Jesus and about how to live the Christian life. But perhaps these disciples have missed something here. Perhaps they are more concerned with their theoretical theology than practical theology. It seems they didn't have much compassion and didn't ask Jesus if he could or would heal the man. Jesus gives a short answer that doesn't really answer their question fully, but he has compassion and he quickly engages with the blind man and begins the healing process. So I'm going to move on to the blind man himself now. I'll come back to Jesus a bit later. In those days, it was common to believe that suffering must be the result of some sin, either personal or generational sin. Someone must have done something wrong. And there are some in the broader Hindu tradition today um, that, that think this way. And there's a belief among many in karma that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. But Jesus rejects this. One of the commentators, Tom Wright, says, we have to stop thinking of the world as a kind of moral slot machine where people put in a coin, a good act, say, or an evil one, and get out a particular result, a reward or a punishment. Of course, actions have consequences. Good things often happen as a result of good actions. Kindness produces gratitude. And bad things often happen through bad actions. Drunkenness causes car accidents. But this isn't inevitable. Kindness is sometimes scorned, and some drunkards get away with it. And interestingly, Jesus doesn't comment on the reason for the man's blindness, but he reaches out to him. His attitude is not one of condemnation, but of compassion. Another commentator says, We should not be concerned with assigning blame. Trying to figure out the source of suffering in an individual's life is futile, given our limited understanding, as the book of Job should teach us. Rather, here is one in whom Jesus can manifest God's works and thus reveal something of God himself and his purposes on earth. Jesus is being led by his Father to provide a sign that he is indeed the light of the world, in this sign, he continues to reveal the Father's glory, that is, his love and mercy. And it's clear from later verses that the man didn't really know who Jesus was. And it doesn't appear that he was expecting anything from him. 
but he must have seen the group with Jesus at the centre and realised that something was going on as he allows Jesus to take some mud and mix it with spit and place it on his eyes. And this was not as revolting as it seems to us today. In those days, saliva was thought to have medicinal properties and was often used like this. Jesus then told the man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, and he immediately did this. He was obedient, even though he didn't really fully understand what was happening. I'm going to come back to the man in a minute, but first let's look at a character in this story, and I'm making assumptions here, who isn't actually mentioned, and that's the invisible man or woman. Remember that our main character was blind from birth, and even if he had a little bit of sight, Jesus had just given him a complete mud pack covering his eyes. How was he going to find his way to the pool? Someone had to take him there and help him. Someone who came alongside and was instrumental in his healing. So the man went to the pool of Siloam as instructed, washed off the mud and could immediately see. Whether Jesus endowed the mud with some healing properties or it was the water in the pool that did the trick, we can only speculate. But most likely it was simply the man's obedience to Jesus' instructions. Just imagine for a minute what that must have been like, not to have seen anything ever and then to see clearly. We can imagine that this was truly amazing for the man, but I'm also wondering whether it was also traumatic. If this happened today, there'd be all sorts of therapy going on to help someone adjust to a new life. But perhaps the healing included the therapy of the Holy Spirit, as it seems the man was quite lucid and in control. The next characters in the story are the man's neighbours, those who've probably known him for most of his life and were used to seeing him sitting and begging for the people to provide for him. Quite clearly, there was such a transformation in the man that he was almost unrecognisable, so much so that some people thought he must have a look-alike. His eyes might have been healed, he was obviously the same man, but his behaviour confused them and they disagreed about who he was. And that can happen today too. When Jesus comes into our lives, his Holy Spirit begins a work of transformation in us that can sometimes make people confused about who we are. As the well-known chorus, I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God I stand. And this demonstrates what can happen when we are touched by God. We become a new creation. We have a new life in Christ that can make us appear different to those who've known us. I'm sure you've read of testimonies of this happening. Perhaps you have a testimony of your own. And as the neighbours questioned the man about what had happened, he gave his testimony. Just a simple description. No spiritual mumbo-jumbo. No real understanding of who Jesus was. Just telling his story. But rather than rejoicing with the man, his, the neighbours took him before the local religious leaders. In a way, this was normal practice to have any spiritual occurrence verified by the priests or, and Pharisees. And it can be a wise thing to do today. You've probably heard of people pretending to be healed, to whip up emotions at a big event. But in this case, they were also concerned because the healing had occurred on the Sabbath, a day when no work, including healing, should be done. Instead of celebrating the man's new sight and new life, they were concerned that the religious law should be upheld and perhaps a bit worried that they might be implicated in this so-called sin. But for our central character, this trip to the Pharisees opened up a whole can of worms. He again related to the Pharisees simply what had happened to him, not giving any explanation, just the facts. But the religious leaders refused to believe what they'd been told or could see for themselves. Some dismissed the healing as something sinful because it happened on the Sabbath. But others were more cautious, as obviously something miraculous had happened. And it's not unusual even today for religious leaders to disagree and even to disregard a work of God. But the irony here is that the man who was blind could now see, and those who were supposed to lead and guide the people in spiritual matters couldn't see what was, an excuse the pun, blindingly obvious. That a man who was known in the community to have been blind from birth 
could now see and was telling everyone about the man who did it, even though he didn't fully understand who Jesus was. Now next, the man's parents come into the story, called in by the Pharisees to identify their son and confirm what had happened to him. I don't know about you, and it might be a, a difference in culture, but I find this dialogue harsh. Hardly the attitude of loving parents, maybe. Perhaps it was the culture of the time, but I find it hard to understand why the man was begging on the streets in the first place if he had two parents, even if he was an adult. And in those days, men were adults at 13. They identify him, but refuse to rejoice and celebrate the wonderful transformation that has taken place. And why was this? Because they were fearful of being thrown out of the synagogue. And that was a serious threat in those days. The synagogue was the place where life happened, where you not only worshipped, but perhaps received help, made business contacts, enjoyed a social life, and had significant relationships. Excommunication was a serious threat. But their son had been miraculously healed, and sadly, they were more fearful of man than of God, and they refused to support him. Eventually, the Pharisees call the man back, and it seems that they now believe he has been healed, because they say in verse 24, God should get the glory for this. But in saying this, they are refusing to believe that Jesus is from God. They are denying that he is the promised Messiah. They go on to talk about the Old Testament prophet and leader Moses, the very Moses that spoke of the promised Messiah. They knew their scriptures, they had all the tools to see, but they refused to look. They were the ones who were blind. And this is so common today. God has made himself obvious, but many people refuse to look. Not only do they not see Jesus like the Pharisees, they don't see God. There's a passage in Romans 1 which says, They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. And this is what's happening to the Pharisees. They were confused and divided. They again questioned the man, hoping, I imagine, that he would deny everything. But he's given amazing boldness, and he stands up to them, giving them a dose of the truth. And this enrages them, and they bring the episode, as far as they are concerned, to a conclusion by throwing him out of the synagogue. As I've previously explained, this was a serious punishment. But look what happens in verse 35. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. Jesus reached out to the outcast. He looked for him in his time of need. He took the initiative. How beautiful that is. What a picture of the Jesus who pursues us, even when we're not even sure of who he is. And we sang this morning, didn't we, in that song, Reckless Love. He chases me down, leaves the 99. He pursues us. Jesus very simply asked the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Again, it's clear the man doesn't really understand, but knows there's something worth believing in. And that's all it takes for Jesus to reveal who he is, causing the man to believe and to worship. But Jesus hasn't finished with the Pharisees yet. His closing words in this passage are addressed to them. He could have quoted from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, except it hadn't been written yet. But listen to what Paul says. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. We have to remember that Satan is at work in our world today, and actually it's not difficult to believe that when you look around, and that one of his main aims is to stop people accepting Jesus' rescue package, to knowing the love, mercy, and acceptance of God, and the transforming and healing power of the Holy Spirit, and the promise of eternal life. 
The Pharisees should have reckoned who Jesus was. They'd done all the research. But as John says in chapter 1 of his gospel, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. So why did Jesus pick on this blind man? He makes it clear in verse 3 to 5 of today's reading, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned, uh, assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. And in the previous chapter it says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. And in Luke 4, he lays out his manifesto. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Jesus was, is, and always will be true to his manifesto. He brought his life into this man's life, not only light that enabled him to see for the first time in this present life, but light that ensured that he would live in that light for eternity. As we look to all the characters in this passage, I wonder which one or ones you might identify with. Just think back for a minute and, and ask God to show you. Are you maybe one of his, the disciples, eager to learn more about the kingdom of God, but perhaps not so eager to put it into practice, not noticing those in need? Are we like the man's neighbours, slow to recognise what God is doing amongst us? What about the man's parents? Are we so fearful of what others might say or do that we avoid giving testimony about what God has done in our life? Are we reluctant to tell others that we are a Christian, fearful that we'll be mocked? Will it harm our promotion prospects? Will others think that we're mad? Are we like the Pharisees? Are we sometimes blind to what God is doing in our midst? Are we sometimes so tied up with getting things right or following the rules that we miss the unusual, something new, or something that doesn't fit with our idea of church? As the hymn says, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Do we identify with the blind man, sensing something of God, but not really understanding? Do we need the invisible man to help us on our spiritual journey, encouraging us to be obedient, leading us to a place of healing? Do we want to know more of God, to know his son Jesus at work in our lives? Do we need the healing power of Jesus, physically, emotionally, or spiritually? Do we need the transforming power of the Holy Spirit? Could we be that invisible man or woman helping others on their spiritual journey, leading them towards the light of the world? And, and what a privilege that is. Who are you in this chapter? And what about Jesus? What can we learn about him today? How can we be like him? Firstly, Jesus approached the blind man. He took the initiative. The man hadn't asked him for anything. It's God who chases us down. We just need to respond. Jesus had compassion. He put aside the theological discussion to bring light into the man's life. Jesus didn't deny the sin of the man or his parents. The cause of the man's suffering didn't matter. And our past sins don't matter to him either. When we believe in Jesus, they are gone and forgotten. Jesus doesn't need us to have everything sorted before he can act in our lives. The blind man didn't even know who he was. Isn't that a relief? He didn't even need to believe to be healed. The belief came later. And Jesus revealed himself to the man at the end of the passage, after the man had been obedient, after he had given his testimony, after he had stood up to the religious leaders, after he had been excommunicated. Sometimes it takes a while for us to really get to know Jesus. And it's a common phrase nowadays, it's all about the journey. So finally, what about us? Are we willing to be obedient to God, like the blind man, even when we don't understand? Are we sometimes too judgmental of others, 
like the disciples looking at their behavior, their character, their past misdemeanors, before we look with compassion at their need for Jesus? Are we willing to be used by Jesus to bring healing to someone else, just like our invisible man? Are we willing to share our testimony? And we all have one or more stories to tell. Perhaps Jesus is asking each of us today, where are you in your journey with me? Are we willing to have Jesus use us, lead us, and love us on our journey with him? Amen.